We are here because we're concerned about terrible things that are happening in Syria for the last year and a half. We are not a political group. We are not proposing who is right and who is wrong. Neither are we suggesting what uh, our nation should do about that situation. We come because we believe this is a problem uh, beyond human solutions. And so we come in a spirit of prayer tonight. We represent many different traditions uh, of attitudes of prayer, belief in the eternal, uh, belief in something beyond ourselves or within ourselves that leads us to a higher nature. And those are the things we want to affirm tonight. Uh, the program in your hand tells the agencies that have helped to set up this program. There are tables on each side with literature that you might like to pick up uh, after we adjourn. But we're going to begin uh, with a prayer and it will be bed, led by Lisa Alfreti in the Episcopalian tradition. And before she reads, we will hear the sound of a bell calling us to silence. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For this community, the nation, and the world, especially Syria. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, oppression, and violence. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, for the special needs and concerns of Syria. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in your tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I will now introduce, we're going to sing a song, the Song of Peace, it's in your, in your uh, program. The tune of Finlandia, uh, Mark Babson from the Friends Meeting House and the Salem Chamber Orchestra will be playing for us. This is my song, O oh God of all the nations, a song of peace for lands of far and wide. This is my home, the country where my heart is. Here are my homes, my dreams. 
is my prayer. Oh, we don't have the third verse. Okay. <laughs> All right. Our next speaker, I'd like to introduce Carrie Fox. She's been in Salem a short time. She's starting a food co-op. She's been active with Move to Amend, and she's the program director for Oregon Peace Works. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for participating in this vigil to bring an end to violence and brutality in Syria. The Syrian uprising began in reaction to the Tunisian Revolution, which touched off the Arab Spring and eventually liberated Egypt from decades of dictatorship. The people of Syria stood up in March of, 20, of 2011, hoping for the same result. Unfortunately, that is not happening. They are instead mired in a deadly conflict where their president, Hafez al-Assad, seems more interested in retaining power than he is in the well-being of his people. We are here today to focus on the refugees who are displaced and dependent as a result of this conflict, a conflict that is now officially termed a civil war by the United Nations due to the, due to the failure of al-Assad to implement any part of a settlement between the warring sides put in place by himself and former United Nations Executive Director Kofi Annan. The United Nations High Commission on Refugees, the UNHCR, reports that since the current turmoil in Syria began in March 2011, the conflict has, the conflict has left more than 10,000 dead and over 120,000 people, perhaps as high as one million people, displaced and in search of safety in the neighboring countries of Turkey, Lebanon, Iraq, and Jordan. I fear for the civilians caught up in the violence in Damascus, including the large Iraqi refugee population residing there, the High Commissioner of Refugees recently stated. An example of such a reality is an Iraqi refugee family of seven that was found dead in their apartment in Damascus, while three other refugees were killed by gunfire. Despite the security challenges, UNHCR staff continued to maintain hotlines and keep some key offices open. Hundreds of frightened refugees have called the hotline and outreach volunteers, reporting direct threats and fears of being caught up in the fighting. They're reporting a lack of safety, fear of ongoing shelling, and lack of access to food, water, and sanitation. Families unable to leave the violent areas are requesting help to assist in relocation. Many newly arriving Syrian refugees are entirely dependent on humanitarian aid, some arriving with only the clothes on their backs and few or no financial resources, following many months of unemployment. The needs of those who arrived earlier in the year are also increasing as, as their savings have become depleted. As the exodus continues to grow, UNHCR is appealing for more support for both the $193 million Syria Regional Response Plan to help Syrian refugees in these countries. Also currently, I'm sorry, currently that plan is only 26% funded. The Syria Humanitarian Assistance Response Plan, an interagency appeal led by the UN Office for Humanitarian Coordination to support affected Syrians inside their own country, has only received 38 million of the $188 million needed. The refugees depend on UNHCR's assistance and the goodwill of their hosts to survive. If you're interested to help with this, um, please see Anita over at the UN table afterwards. Next, I'd like to introduce Bruce Stock of Salem FOR, and he is going to read a statement from Fellowship of Reconciliation USA. This is a statement from uh, Leela Zand, and uh, she is a staff person on Fellowship of Reconciliation uh, USA with a uh, specialty in peace and justice work in the Middle East. This statement was uh, written by Leela on February 20th, 2012 at 8.08 uh, a.m. The bitter news of a, mur a murderous action in Syria filled international media yesterday. 
Three Syrian leaders were killed, including the defense minister and the former defense minister. To this point, no specific individual or organization has accepted responsibility for this bombing. The Fellowship of Reconciliation has followed Syria's events closely and sought to support a peaceful resolution of the conflict. So yesterday's news fills us with grief. As an advocate for peace and justice for almost 100 years, FOR encourages a people power method of focusing on active nonviolence as the means to lasting social and political change. Following the Gandhian nonviolent path towards justice and change in a society, FOR is against any form of violence, whether it appears in the forms of state-sponsored imprisonment, torture, or killing of members of opposition groups and activists, or in the key form of violent resistant actions like yesterday's, which saw the assassination of key members of the Syrian government. Violence begets violence, which we believe closes the path for reconciliation in a just society. In this time of high level tensions throughout much of the Middle East, such violent acts between Syrian government and opposition groups provide the opportunity for other actors to negatively exploit this situation for their own purposes. FOR continues to call for the release of Syrian nonviolent prisoners of conscience, people from all walks of Syrian society who seek peaceful change in their country. We condemn the attacks on numerous villages and municipalities that are widely seen as led by the Syrian army. And we strongly condemn yesterday's assassination of government officials. FOR calls for the opposition and government of Syria to find a way to reconciliation and peaceful resolution of the conflict as quickly as possible, bringing together all the parties. I next would like to uh, introduce Craig Morrow, a Unitarian Universalist minister uh, from Pasco, Washington, who resides here in Salem. And uh, he will be doing a reading and uh, reflection for us. Everybody wonders, what will it be like when the world comes to an end? Here's what the Quran says about it. First in Arabic. Please forgive me, those of you who know Arabic much better than I do. But Ida Ashams Kuwirat, Wa Ida Anujum in Kadarat, Wa Ida Ajibal Suyirat, Wa Ida Al Rishar Utalat, Wa Ida Al Wahush Hushrat, Wa Ida Al Bihar Sujirat, Wa Ida Anufus Zujat, Wa Ida Al Mauda to Suilat Bi Aidan bin Kutilat. Here it is in English. When the sun is folded up, when the stars become like mud, when the mountains are just gone, when is this? It's judgment day. What we call nature begins to collapse, starting with the elements, and now come the animals. When the 10-month pregnant camels are abandoned, when the wild beasts close in. So the people who first heard these words a she-camel just about to deliver a calf was one of the greatest things you could possess. Your family's wealth and power growing before your very eyes. You'd never abandon such a treasure unless the world was coming to an end, which it is, remember. If the Quran had first arrived in our times and our place, the verse might have been when the SUVs are abandoned with the soccer teams inside. We don't know much about pregnant camels here, but we love our cars and our kids. Now these things we love are left behind and the things we fear come close. I tried translating the next verse as when the wild beasts close in, but it could also be when the monsters rally or when the creatures of the waste gather. Muslims say that the Quran is untranslatable, and I do like the original language best of all. Ida al wuhush hushrat the whooshing sound of things our senses can't quite translate into anything we know, rusting past us on all sides, rushing in on top of us. When the wild things 
close in. And when the seas boil over, there's so much for the elements and the animals. But what are we waiting to hear? What do we really want to know about? What about the people? How will it end for us? The passage continues by speaking about when the souls are sorted by kind. We've all heard about some kind of sorting at the end of life, no matter what our religious tradition. Some will be in, some will be out, sorted up or down. And how will it go for me? I wonder. But that's not the question that matters right now, not what about me. What is the question? No one asks directly. We come in at the middle of a sentence. And when the little girl who was buried alive is asked, for what crime was she killed? The sun is rolled up. The stars gone dark. The mountains are simply gone. The wild beasts rush around us while the boiling seas close in. The only human sound is a question about the slaughter of the innocent. It's not really posed to us. We're simply allowed to overhear it. Child, for what crime were you killed? For what crime were you killed? Did you hear it? Did you hear the question? It's the first question on Judgment Day, the one that determines how our souls will be sorted in or out. What about the innocent victims? of human violence. Maybe they live in faraway places, but is it only your own cars or kids who matter? Did you stand by them? Did you stand up for them? What did you do? What did you say? Did you at least, at the very least, pray? It's enough to make you think that you should have done something. And that's the whole point. That's what the Quran has set out to do, to make us think, to get us to do something before this last day of all the days that will ever be, to do what we can for peace now, before the sun folds up and we find ourselves trembling in the darkness. I thank you for your kind attention. If I understand correctly, the Quran insists on your attention and praise for your kindness as powerfully as it can. Is that about right? Thank you. <laughs> to the people of Syria, to the mothers and fathers, to the sons and daughters, to the grandfathers and grandmothers, and to all the others, to the government wielding power with a heavy hand, desperately trying to hold on to their rule, and to all those who are struggling desperately to break free of that rule, people of Syria, the citizens of the world are watching, watching with a sense of dread and helplessness, while in their hearts and their minds and on their lips the time-worn and weary questions are asked. Will we ever learn that hatred and fear does not cease through more hatred and fear? Will we ever learn that war is not the answer to peace? How can we find peace through killing one another? War never builds bridges into the lands of peace. War scars the motherland and destroys the motherland's children. People of Syria, as you struggle to survive the scourge of war and conflict, I hold for you the flame of hope in my heart. For I believe that deep within the heart of all humanity, there are seeds of goodness awaiting, germinating, planted there by the great universal mind from which every one of us has evolved and ready to express and fulfill a divine purpose to create a peaceable kingdom a peaceable kingdom with a just and averted society populated by the God-granted free will beings that we are and who we are becoming born to be, to be able to choose and choosing to seek peace, choosing and willing 
to act as co-creators for a peace that works with the will to good for everyone. People of Syria, my brothers, my sisters, and all the citizens of the world, I wish to share that great hope of goodness with you as I read these loving words full of peace from one of my favorite books, Prayers for a Thousand Years, poetry written by authors Rolf Jacobson, Jane Hirschfield, and Anwar Fazal. And I begin with these beautiful words. They're all children when they sleep. There is no war in them. They open their hands and breathe in the slow rhythm given to humans by heaven. Whether soldiers or statesmen, servants or masters, they purse their lips like small children when they sleep. And they all have half-open hands. And stars stand watch then and watch. And the arch of the sky is hazed over for a few hours when no one will harm another while they sleep. And if only we could talk with each other then, when hearts are like half-open flowers, words would push their way in like golden bees. And then, perhaps, for a few moments, guns would go silent around the countryside. And the wheels of war would stop rolling through neighborhoods where children have played. And a hush will fall over the world. And for an instant, in the stillness, the chiming of celestial spheres will be heard as earth hangs poised in the crystalline darkness and then slowly, gracefully tilts towards peace. And in that divine moment, we let there be a season when holiness is heard and the splendor of living is revealed. And stunned to stillness by beauty, we remember. We remember who we are and why we're here. We're here for love. And we are not alone. For in the universe, there moves a great power whose gestures alter Earth's axes always towards love. And in the immense darkness, there's no fear. And everything just spins with joy. Spins with joy. And the cosmos enfolds us and holds us. And we're caught in a web of stars cradled in a swaying embrace and rocked by the holy night, babes of the universe. And as we let go and let God, we let this be the time that we wake to life as spring awakes in the moments of winter, of winter solstice. And we realize with such awe and such wonder that we all drink from one water. We all breathe from one air. We rise from one ocean. And we live under one sky, and we remember who we are. We are one. The newborn baby cries the same, and the laughter of children is universal, and everyone's blood is red. And our hearts beat the same song, and we remember who we are. We're one. We're the brothers and sisters, one family, one earth. Together we live, and together we die. Remember, we are one. Peace be on you, brothers and sisters. Peace be on you, brothers and sisters. Of the living one family, living upon the one planet, the one mother of us all. Peace be upon us all. Amen to that. I invite us all now for a couple of moments to just go within in silent prayer and allow the essence of this time to sow our intentions out for peace to the people of Syria and to the world. We'll start by the bell ringing and then we'll come out of it as the bell rings. So let's go in for a couple of minutes as the bell rings.
And now I'd like to introduce Kawajar Hussain. Kawajar Hussain. Uh, my name is Kawadar Hussain, and I am an incoming sophomore at McNary High School. I'd like to start off by saying may God bless those in Syria and help them get out of the predicament that they're in right now. I know a Syrian man who wasn't able to come here and speak publicly because he was afraid for his family back home in Syria, that they would be targeted somehow. It's happened before, which I think is unbelievable. Um, I'd like to give a few words about peace. Jesus said, love thy neighbor as thyself. The Torah said, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. The Muslim Hadith said, none of you truly believes until he wishes to his brother what he wishes to himself. Apparently, we all want peace. So why can't we have it? Why can't, or what is it anyways? I decided to look it up and get an official definition. And the Merriam-Webster Dictionary says it is a state of tranquility or quiet as freedom from civil disturbance and state of security or order, harmony in personal relations. Maybe it's just me, but that's a tall order, and it may not be completely achievable, but one could always try to apply it in their personal life. Now, after the issue in Syria is over, we're still going to have the matter of peace, or rather, the non-existence of complete world peace. We can try to do something about that, though. We, myself included, can start by resting our quick judgments of others, respecting our differences, and cherishing our similarities. Like Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. And remember that the world can only change one person at a time. God bless all. I'm the executive director of Association for Communal Harmonia, and we, our mission is to bring about or promote peace in South Asia and harmony among all South Asians everywhere. Today, I'm going to present to you a prayer from Yajur Veda, which is one of the four Vedas, the ancient Hindu scriptures. Uh, Om Deo Shanti 
Antariksha Shanti Prithvi Shanti Rapa Shanti Roshadhyaya Shanti Vanaspataya Shanti Vishvadevaya Shanti Brahma Shanti Sama Shanti Shanti Redhi Shanti Sama Shanti Reva Om Shanti 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 God Almighty let there be peace in all regions of the universe peace upon the earth peace upon the sun and other planets and peace in the air and in the waters let there be peace in the herbs and vegetation peace upon all the learned sages and teachers let our learning and meditation be blessed with peace peace here peace there peace everywhere bless us all everyone with peace and most of all bless leaders on all sides of the conflict in Syria and similar other conflicts around the world and especially those who want to intervene so that they intervene in such a manner that violence and peace, violence and injustice is not escalated and that leaders on all sides of the conflict resolve their disagreements in a peaceful and just manner. Om Shanti 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 And uh, let, let me invite uh, Mr. Lee Cohen. He will uh, present a reading from the Hebrew scriptures. This is Salem. Salem derives its name from the Hebrew Shalom or the Arabic Salam. They were once brothers Ishmael and Isaac. And unfortunately now they are in separate camps. It is altogether fitting that we spend this evening celebrating the spirit of Salam or Shalom and trying to make it not just uh, a slogan but a reality. So I'm going to read something from the Hebrew scriptures and it is called bless us with peace it is derived from the gates of repentance O source of peace lead us to peace a peace profound and true lead us to a healing to mastery of all that drives us to war within ourselves and with others. May our deeds inscribe us in the book of life and blessing, righteousness, and peace. O source of peace, bless us with peace. Very short and poignant. I'd now like to take this opportunity to introduce a longtime, probably lifelong peace activist from our own community of Salem and a person who practices and profoundly Professor's Meditation, my old young friend, Jerry Raza. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, brother. Thank you. I'm honored to be here this evening. As I look at all of our faces and all the traditions that we represent, I know there's one commonality, and that is the word of love. And so I begin with one of my favorite pieces from St. Francis of Assisi. He wasn't Buddhist, but he 
Certainly, we all know of his work as a peace activist. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. That's only a portion of the prayer. And now I would like to share several pieces from the Buddhist scriptures. One is the discourse on love. He or she who wants to attain peace should practice upright, humble, and capable of using loving speech. He or she will know how to live simply and happily with senses calmed, without being covetous and carried away by their emotions or the emotions of the majority. Let him or her not do anything that will be disapproved by the wise ones. And this is what he or she contemplates. May everyone be happy and safe. May all hearts be filled with joy. May all beings live in security and in peace. Beings who are frail, strong, tall or short, big or small, invisible or visible, near or far away, already born or yet to be born. May all of them dwell in perfect tranquility. Let no one do harm to anyone. Let no one put the life of anyone in danger. Let no one of, out of anger or ill will wish, out, wish any harm on anyone. Just as a mother loves and protects her only child at the risk of her own life, cultivate boundless love to offer to all living beings in the entire cosmos. Let our boundless love pervade the whole universe, above, below, and across. Our love will know no obstacles. Our heart will be free from hatred and enmity, whether standing or walking, sitting or lying, or as long as we are awake, we should maintain this mindfulness of love in our own heart. This is the noble way of living. Free from wrong views and sensual desires, living in beauty, realizing perfect understanding, those who practice boundless love will transcend birth and death. Based on this discourse on love, there's a famous meditation. It's called metta or loving kindness meditation. It's one that I believe is one of the older prayers, 2,600 years. I'm sure there are older ones. Yet we realize that in this prayer we can helpfully transform our own anger, our own discomfort by instead of dwelling on those feelings, not to avoid them, but to dwell on the concept of love. And if we in fact can be loving, then we can project that to others. So because of time, I will share a shortened version of this metta or loving kindness. And so first we focus eyes open or closed on our breathing and we breathe in and breathe out. And say to yourself quietly, may I be peaceful, happy, and safe. May I be peaceful, happy, and safe as I breathe in and breathe out. May I be free from anger, fear, and worries as I breathe in and out. May I be free from anger, fear, and worries. May I look at myself with the eyes of understanding and love as I breathe in and breathe out. Looking at myself with the eyes of understanding and love. And now we think about the conditions brought about the Syrian uprising and all the people that have been influenced and affected, even people in Salem, Oregon, and people in all cities and parts of the world. And with them in our mind, we 
send this metta or loving kindness to them. May they be peaceful, happy, and safe, breathing this message in and sending it out as we exhale and breathe out. May they be peaceful, happy, and safe. As we breathe in, may they be free from anger, fear, and worries. So we send that message as we breathe out. May they be free from anger, fear, and worries, sending that metta to them who are in need. May they look at themselves with the eyes of understanding and love. And we send that message to them as we exhale. May they look at themselves with the eyes of understanding and love. And so may we be an instrument of peace. May we find that when there is hatred or anger or challenges in ourselves, may we change the seed to that of loving kindness. And if we can feel that loving kindness within us, we can then be peacemakers as we extend that loving kindness to others who are suffering. And now I'm pleased to introduce uh, my brother from the Catholic tradition, Father Tim Mekaitis from the Queen of Peace Catholic Church. I'm constantly amazed by when speakers come together and have not ever met until the moment, how universal the themes seem to fit together. I wanted to share this evening two pieces, one from the New Testament, from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 10, a very well-known parable of Jesus called the Good Samaritan, a story about forgiveness, reconciliation, and building bridges. And the second part, I'd like to share some words that were spoken to the General Assembly of the, of the United Nations 47 years ago that I think are as timely today as they were then. Again, words of reconciliation and peace. So from the Gospel of St. Luke, we hear this story well known of, of our Lord Jesus. There was a scholar of the law who stood up to test him and said, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? He said in reply, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He replied to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But because he wished to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man fell victim to robbers and as he went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, they stripped him and beat him and went off leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that same road but when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. Likewise, a Levite came to the place, and when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. But a Samaritan traveler who came upon him was moved with compassion at the sight. He approached the victim, poured oil and wine over his wounds, and bandaged, and bandaged them. Then he lifted him up on his own animal, took him to an inn, and cared for him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave, him, gave them to the innkeeper with the instruction, take care of him. And if you spend more than what I have given you, I shall repay you on my way back. Which of these three, in your opinion, was neighbor to the robber's victim? He answered, the one who treated him with mercy. Jesus said to him, then go and do likewise. 47 years ago, on October 4th, 
1965, the leader of the Universal Catholic Church, Pope Paul VI, was invited to the United States. It was the very first time the leader of the Catholic Church had ever come to the United States. Paul VI is known in our circles as a wise, a kind of prophet, one who spoke with great courage. As he addressed the United Nations, the General Assembly of the United Nations, on October 4th, which happened to be the memorial of St. Francis of Assisi, a great troubadour of peace, Pope Paul spoke these words that were meaningful then and have not in any way lost their power in our own day. Men cannot be brothers if they are not humble. It is pride, no matter how inevitable it may seem to be, which provokes tensions and struggles of prestige, of predominance or colonialism, of selfishness. It is pride that disrupts brotherhood. Never one against other, never, never again. The clear words of a great man, the late John Kennedy, speak. Mankind must put an end to war, or war will put an end to mankind. Long discourses are not necessary to proclaim the supreme goal. It is enough to remember that the blood of millions of men, numberless and unprecedented sufferings, useless slaughter and frightful ruin are the sanction of the covenant which unites you in a solemn pledge which must change the future history of the world. No more war, war never again. It is peace, peace which must guide the destinies of peoples and of all mankind. Let the weapons fall from your hands. One cannot love with offensive weapons in his hands. Those weapons, especially the terrible weapons that modern science has given long before they produce victims and ruins, cause dreams, bad dreams, foster bad feelings, create nightmares, distrust, and somber resolves. They demand enormous expenditures. They obstruct projects of solidarity and useful work. They falsify the very psychology of peoples. Today, as never before, in an era marked by such human progress, there is need for an appeal to the moral conscience. For the danger comes not from progress nor from science. The real danger comes from man himself, who has at his disposal ever more powerful instruments, which can be used as well for destruction as for the loftiest conquests. In a word, then, the edifice of modern civilization must be built upon spiritual principles, the only principles capable not only of supporting it, but also of enlightening and animating it. And these indispensable principles of superior wisdom must be founded upon our faith in God. He is the living God, the Father of all. Powerful words to the United Nations and powerful words still to us. I'd like to introduce Julie Varga from the Baha'i Fellowship with a word. I'm really happy to be here and really happy to see the members of this part of the human family supporting other members in another part of the world. 160 years ago or so, Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, came with a mission to, um, his mission was to unify humankind, bringing principles and um, spiritual knowledge that would help us live as one family. And as the 160 years have unfolded, more and more we see evidence that in all, and there goes my talk. We see evidence that this knowledge is spreading and being confirmed and that the truths of all religions are being found again about our oneness. I want to read two brief selections. One is about justice, and maybe it's a little bit different take on justice. It's from the hidden words of Baha'u'llah. 
The second selection is a prayer for mankind by the son of Baha'u'llah, Abda Baha, who also spent his life um, working for unity and living out unity and love. O oh, son of spirit, the best beloved of all things in my sight is justice. Turn not away therefrom if thou desirest me, and neglect it not that I may confide in thee. By its aid thou shalt see with thine own eyes, and not through the eyes of others, and shalt know of thine own knowledge, and not through the knowledge of thy neighbor. Ponder this in thy heart, how it behooveth thee to be. Verily, justice is my gift to thee, and a sign of my loving kindness. Set it then before thine eyes. O thou kind Lord, thou hast created all humanity from the same stock. Thou hast decreed that all shall belong to the same household. In thy holy presence they are all thy servants, and all mankind are sheltered beneath thy tabernacle. All have gathered together at thy table of bounty. All are illumined through the light of thy providence. O oh God, thou art kind to all. Thou hast provided for all. Thus shelter all, conferest life upon all. Thou hast endowed each and all with talents and faculties, and all are submerged in the ocean of thy mercy. O oh, thou kind Lord, unite all. Let the religions agree and make the nations one, so that they may see each other as one family and the whole earth as one home. May they all live together in perfect harmony. O oh God, raise aloft the banner of the oneness of mankind. O oh God, establish the most great peace. Cement thou, O God, the hearts together, O thou kind Father, God. Gladden our hearts through the fragrance of thy love. Brighten our eyes through the light of thy guidance. Delight our ears with the melody of thy word, and shelter us all in the stronghold of thy providence. Thou art the mighty and powerful. Thou art the forgiving and thou art the one who overlooketh the shortcomings of all mankind. I'd like to introduce Addis Lane Palagi, deacon of the Episcopal Church. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Desmond Tutu, the giant, four foot eleven, Archbishop of South Africa, and the head of the Episcopal Church of Africa, speaks constantly about the necessity of forgiveness. Forgiveness is a great challenge, but we will never recover from anything until we learn to forgive. He also speaks very clearly of a quality called Ubuntu. You know that name, I'm sure. It is the feeling of caring for your fellow man and for doing something about it. It's the quality of being human. A solitary human being is a contradiction in terms. You cannot be solitary and be human. A human feels what another human feels. A spider web is a perfect example of this concept. If you jiggle just one thread of a spider web, it will be felt throughout the entire web, and certainly by the spider, and there will be a reaction to that one jiggle. Thus it is that we are here tonight. Love and caring here, and 
Peace Plaza in a small town, in a small populated state in the great United States, which is very little compared to the universe, but it is here that we pray. And when we pray here, it will be felt everywhere, and especially where it matters. Ubuntu is like that, because we have that quality, or we want to have that quality. Whatever befalls one group of people will befall the rest of us. We are one. But you know that. You know that because that's why you're here. That's why you're here asking God for peace for Syria. Here in Peace Plaza where they don't even know we are here, but we know they are there. And we are going to pray for them. So we pray for Syria tonight because we can't sleep at night. And we shouldn't because people are hurting. And we want to hurt for them and we want to help them because we want to pray. And we are going to pray because it is the greatest wireless network in the world. Yes, it is. What we say here will go straight up to God and straight over where it belongs to be. And we know that. Now we are going to do a little chant here tonight. You've not been speaking for almost an hour, so you might be a little, little harsh in the voice, but that's all right. I'd like you to stand, please, because we should be shoulder to shoulder for this. You don't know even what we're going to say, but you will, and you'll say it too. Oh God, well, we're going to start out here with a soft, quiet sound, and then we will get louder and louder and louder as our hearts begin to hurt and beat stronger. We'll say it a long time and many times so that you will know it by the time we're through. We start out with this. Oh God, we pray for peace. Say it. In Syria. In Syria. Oh God, we pray for peace in Syria. Oh God, we pray for peace in Syria. In Syria. In Syria. Stop the pain, God. Stop the pain, God, please. Stop the pain, God, please. In Syria. In Syria. In Syria. Oh, God, stop the pain. Oh, God, stop the pain. In Syria. In Syria. Oh, God, we pray for peace. Oh, God, we pray for peace. In Syria. In Syria. Oh, God, we pray for peace. Oh, God, we pray for peace. For peace, for peace. For peace, for peace. For peace, for peace. In Syria. In Syria. Stop the pain, oh God. Oh, stop the pain, oh God. In Syria. In Syria. Stop the killing. Stop the terror. Stop the hopelessness. Stop the torture. Stop it, stop it, Lord, please. Stop it, stop it, Lord, please. In, Syria, in Syria, we pray, God, please put your hands on Syria and stop the pain. We pray, God, please put, put your, your hands on Syria and stop the pain. In Syria, God. In Syria, God. We little people here pray. We pray for your mighty hands to stop the pain. In Syria. In Syria. In Syria now. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Amen. My heart is still touched by our prayers we had together this moment, so I'm sorry if I won't be able to hardly speak. I wear this today to try to remind myself what it's like to be a Syrian woman and put my 
myself in that place. I've never been to Syria or the Middle East. But I do thank Mr. Uh, Braza, who introduced what I'm going to say, because he's already brought up, and so is another speaker, that St. Francis had been mentioned as one who proclaimed a way in which we can become peacemakers. If you would please turn to the third page of your program in the uh, script where it says, Prayer of St. Francis. I'll give you time to find it. <laughs> give me time to wipe my tears. And I do believe God heard that prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me show love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood. To be loved as to love that we all receive it is in pardoning that we are pardoned and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life mr braza would you lead us in a meditative walk and i Would you please turn to Let There Be Peace on Earth first? Are we going to walk as we sing or right after we sing? Okay. Here's our first note. This is the C. Uh, no. No words can summarize what we just experienced. But one thing I am familiar with is that peace walks have been always a part of uh, putting into action, into each step, in each breath, what we have gained here tonight. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. With every step I take, let this be my solemn vow. So think about the things we have gained, several things, many things tonight. And when we walk, we're going to take one walk around this uh, fountain, a little slower than normal. And what we will do is Lisa will be uh, playing some background flute music. And at the sound of the bell, I'm going to ask you to stand and to uh, get into kind of a, a little circle here and we will I will start the walk going in this direction and in peace walks we are reminded that this is our message peace is in every step as my teacher Thich Nhat Hanh has said 
And our walking is a reminder that we have to take into the world the insights that we know about peace and bring them into our actions. And our simple actions, the simple act of walking every day can be a reminder to bring these lessons back into play. And once again, if we are peaceful, that is the best gift we can give to those in our family and those in the world. So please, uh, I will invite this small, what we call walking bell. We use this in meditation. We do sitting meditation, walking meditation. But you know what? Life is a meditation. We do this so that we can be mindful with every person, with every breath, with every activity we in, are engaged in. So thank you for uh, the organizers. Thank you for uh, Paul LaRue and his committee and everybody who put this together. It was a beautiful experience. And for one, I know that I feel closer to all of you because of what we experienced together. And if we can create these kind of communities here in Salem, we know that this is possible in other parts of the world. Please rise.